Hey guys, before today's episode of the podcast, I want you to check out brandsashka.com slash goodies. That's brandsashka.com slash goodies. It's where I'm dropping all high value content for you to grow as a creative visionary. Check it out, brandsashka.com slash goodies. You're listening to the Visionary on Fire podcast. What's up, fam? It's another cool episode of The Visionary on Fire podcast with Sashka. And today she's mixing things up with education, parenting, business, and antics. It's gonna be a good one. So buckle up and enjoy the episode. All right, visionaries, welcome back to this week's podcast with moi, Sashka, your host, where I invite inspiring and visionary guests such as our guest today from around the world to share their thought leadership on their form of entrepreneurship, their philosophy, and using their learnings from this episode for you to implement today to be the change that you want to see and be in the world. Now, every parent's wish for their children is to be happy, to have the tools to be able to succeed in life, live a life that is little better than what we as parents set out with, And we want to ensure that the world is a good place for our kids to grow up. And all those tools we hope to pass on to our kids is what our next guest grew up with. Now, starting with osmosis through his mom's pregnant belly to being cradled in his dad's arms at three months walking over fire. Our next guest has had the foundation laid out for him nicely. His dad is one of the most or the world's most prominent personal development leaders. Some love him some less, but you cannot argue that the man has presence and knows his stuff, which would lead you to believe that our next guest pretty much had it made for a happy, healthy, and wealthy life, right? He's a successful peak performance and motivational coach, a phenomenal husband, and soon-to-be dad. He's empathic, compassionate, and has a positive and tangible answer to pretty much everything asked. He has a flourishing business. It's all hunky-dory. Sort it, right? Well, yes or no. Now, despite our guest having the foundation with tools to manage whatever personal things are thrown onto one's path, managing those limiting beliefs or breaking through bad habits, our guest questioned why some people would, despite having all the tools, not always follow through. Why would they crash and burn? Now, what he saw was a gap between learning tools and spreading the word with the world. And that was Living the Tools, which, by the way, is the title of his best-selling book, Live It. Our next guest has been awarded the Congressional Award Gold Medal for his commitment to bettering humanity and himself from an early age. He was awarded the highest honor. I mean, this is amazing. The highest honor for accomplishing over 400 hours of community service, 200 hours of personal development, 200 hours dedicated to physical fitness, He ran two marathons, I cannot even walk down the stairs without panting, and living overseas for an extended period, he lived in Uganda for four months volunteering, all within just 24 months. He accomplished all of this before the age of 24. And during this time of living his life, his quest, and not just cognitively knowing it, our next guest experienced a moment during his volunteer work in Uganda where his blood cells were attacked, and he was told by the doctors that he had four to five days to live. Now listen, to live visionaries. In that moment, our next guest wasn't afraid of death, but about missing out on living life and what it had to offer. Not just learning and spreading the word, but actually living it. Well, as you can tell, our guest survived the ordeal as he's here with us today to share his wisdom, passion, purpose, and philosophies on living a life on purpose. So let's give him a warm welcome, shall we? Here he is, the one and only, Jarek Robbins. Hello, Jarek. Hi. Well, first off, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I got to tell you, that was one of the most accurate and thorough introductions I've ever had. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I do my research. <laughs> Very nice. I'm excited now, to be sharing with all of you here. So thank you. It is exciting to have you. Not just saying that, it is exciting to have you because it's not. We're all busy, we all have a time, we have a time schedule, and it's just great that you've coughed at some time 
to share with myself and my audience with visionaries. So I'm just going to dive right in. So my audience is our creative visionaries and they have a leniency towards learning a lot to make up for being labeled and boxed in as not knowing enough or being enough. So it's natural that they cognitively know a lot and despite being empathic, very few visionaries actually live their purpose, which is why I am super excited to have you here today to talk all things purpose, visionary and life. So let's delve in with the first section that I like to call or like to delve into with philosophy. I love philosophy. So to be on the same page, define in your words what you see as living a life on purpose. What does purpose mean to you and how do you live it? Sure. So how to live a life on purpose and what does purpose mean to me and how do I live it? According to creative visionaries, the gap that's going to exist there, if I was going to be real specific, is I know this gap very well. And the gap that would naturally exist there is they have an art, they have a passion, they have a talent, they have a skill, they have a trade or a craft. They have something that just captures their mind. It truly holds their heart. And it's something that they're compelled to want to be a part of. They're compelled to want to do, to, to learn about, to thrive in, to, to dance in, to sing in, to sleep in, to wake in, to do everything in. And with that deep joy and passion, they feel compelled to really truly be in it 24-7. And they do want to live their art. They do want to live their truth. They do want to experience the ins and outs, the ups, the downs, the lefts, the rights. And there's deep, deep beauty in that. The challenge they're going to have is the way that society is built today. It's going to be difficult to do that. And in the beginning, pay the bills. It's going to be difficult to do that and have other people who don't have the same passion or connection or sight or vision or insight to support you because they're not going to see it. They're not going to feel it. They're going to go, that's ridiculous. Get a job. Or what are you doing? You can't even take care of your family. What's wrong with you? And you're going to hear these phrases that sound like they're beating you up or pushing you down or knocking you over. And the truth is they're not. They're just not seeing. They don't have the same value you do in whatever art form you have. The next piece that's going to happen is in the marketplace of the world, an artist tends to have a deep love for whatever it is they're creating. They have a deep love and passion for their creation, whether their creation is music or art or family or learning or reading or teaching, or it's some deep passion, playing basketball, playing sport, traveling, giving, creating, designing, whatever their art or passion is, they'll have a deep, deep love for it. And they'll have a love for the birthing process of taking a thought or an emotion or a feeling and bringing it to fruition and bringing it to reality. And the challenge they'll have, and just list the challenges, the challenge you're going to have in the marketplace is they might birth something and take it out to the world and show everyone how beautiful their new thing is or their new art form is. And the marketplace might look at it and go, Ugh, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. And that's going to break their heart. Because that's like, if you had a child, which my wife and I are in the process of doing right now, and we have that baby and my wife takes the baby outside and goes, look how beautiful my baby is. And someone goes, that is one ugly kid. It's going to hurt her feelings. Yeah. And the truth is, she's not going to be able to see it, even if it's true. Because there's going to be a whole bunch of chemicals flooded in her body called oxytocin that as a mother makes her think her kid is beautiful regardless of how her kid actually looks. Now, hopefully it's a good looking kid, but I have no promises in life. (laughs) And there's truth here in the art that these artists create. These visionaries create their art. They take it out to the marketplace and some people look at it and go, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Be gone. I want nothing to do with it. Does that mean their career is over? They'll never make it. They just have to give up on their art and instead go take a job they hate and suffer through life? No. But they're going to have to get real creative on figuring out how to take their talents, their skill sets, their passions, their purpose, their deep values and commitment to who they are and what they love, and how to properly align them in the marketplace. And I always tease people. I say every single thing you could come up with I don't care if it's picking up trash. I don't care if it's traveling or volunteering or giving back or being a good person or painting orange squares. Everything has the ability in the marketplace to truly be monetized at some level 
if you desire that. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, how do you align it with the marketplace? And people go, really? How does caring get monetized? Mm -hmm. I said, well, Mother Teresa did a hell of a job at that. She cared a lot. She was able to fundraise over a million dollars a month into her charities and then give it away to the causes she believed in. I was like, kind of a good job. A million bucks a month ain't bad. <laughs> and they're like, what about laughter? What about just being funny? I'm like, well, Kevin Hart's kind of killing it as a comedian. He fills stadiums of people and makes them laugh and entertains them. And they're like, what about, and anything they've been able to come up with, I've been able to sit down and go, yeah, there's somebody in the world and here's the caveat, here's the key, who's the best in the world at what they do that's been able to completely monetize that joy, that passion, that purpose, that calling, that gift in a very, very deep and powerful way. Now, I'll throw in a second thought before we jump to the next question, mm. which, or I got to answer the first question, but, but I'll throw in a second thought. When I say monetize, I just mean the ability to optimize your trade to provide the life you want. You could optimize it for trading in euros and dollars or pounds or francs or these francs anymore? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in Switzerland. Or yen, but you could use it to monetize that way. Or uh, when I say monetize, you could use it as your trade in society to produce the life you want. You don't need any currency to go in between you, but you can use your trade as your currency where you produce art. People love your art and in return, they provide a place for you to live, all your materials. They provide food, three meals a day, and a whole lifestyle to live. All you do is master your craft all day. And there's someone in the world who'd be like, oh, I'd love an in-house artist that can create for me 24-7, and I just pay for their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. There's someone in the world who'd do that. And it sounds crazy, but they would. They would love to have an artist that inspires them because they work so hard and make so much money in currency that they'd love to have someone that inspires them to live and feel free and alive. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen. I have a friend who's an artist and she makes great money on when she sells her art, but she also has portions of time where she'll go live and someone will invite her to live at their house and give her a studio and let her work 24 seven on her art and not ever have to worry about money. I'm like, well, that's pretty freaking cool. That and, is pretty and, cool. And she's found a way to use her art and connect with someone who believes in it and loves it so much that they're willing to support it. Mm -hmm. And it's not them just paying her to do whatever she wants. She's creating art and that's her job when she's there. Coming back to the question, what does living with purpose mean? Living with purpose is living in deep alignment with what you value most. One thing that I've found is many artists don't value money. And the only people I've found that have a lot of money are people that value money. And so there's weird conflict that happens with artists where they always wonder why they don't have any money. But the truth is they don't value money. You'll never have a lot of what you don't value, which seems simple. But if you don't value relationships, you're not going to have a lot of relationships. If you don't value your health, you probably won't have great health. If you don't value, in this case, monetary funds, you probably won't have a lot of it. And what was interesting, and this was an interesting concept for me, because I love giving. I love helping. I love volunteering. I like my first job was, or second job, my first job was security at Blockbuster Video. But cool. after guarding the DVDs on Friday and Saturday nights, I went to go work for our family's nonprofit and I loved it. I love being able to help people and call it work. And so this concept in helping people all day, the only thing that bugged me was we didn't get paid a lot. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> That's not cool. My art is helping people. I love to go volunteer at the soup kitchen, volunteer at the shelter, help people in need, do all these great things. And then when you work for a nonprofit, you get a paycheck. They're like, well, that sucks. Why do I get so little and I'm doing such good work all day? Mm. And that's a feeling a lot of artists feel. Why do I get so little when I'm doing such good things in the world, when I'm bringing such beautiful, amazing art and creativity to life? Mm. And there was a key here. And the key was not, is it worth it? Does society see it? The key from starting on the inside was, do I really believe it? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. And there was a key here. I remember just, I think a year and a half ago, we were in Aspen with a friend and we went by an art gallery her friend owns. And I walked into the art gallery and I saw a bust that a sculptor had created. And I looked at it and I went, huh, okay. 
in the back of my head, my thought was, I'm pretty sure I could do that better. Just humbly honest, I'm pretty sure I could have sculpted this one better than what was actually there. And I said, what's this one? And they said, oh, that's one of my prized pieces. It's selling for $80,000 this weekend. <coughs> and I was like, shit, I need to do that. <laughs> and this is what not to say to a gallery director. He turned around and he goes, oh my gosh, you're a sculptor? And I said, no, I'm going to create something y'all can sell for 80 grand for me. <laughs> and he went, ugh, and walked away. <laughs> so apparently I pissed off the art director. But in my mind, I just realized something. I said, this human sat down and took all their creativity and mapped out this beautiful piece of art that I think I could have done myself, but mapped it out, did it, brought it to life, and they took it to a place in the world where people valued their art. They took it to a place in the world where people valued their art so much they could trade that piece of art for $80,000 mm. US. I think that's amazing. Yeah. I think this is really important. One thing, if you have art, whether it's singing, dancing, laughing, loving, creativity, whatever creative art you have from within, one big key is you have to find the place where people value the art you have. That's it. Yeah. Someone from India messaged me earlier today and she goes, sir, I want you to teach me peak performance and super learning. I was like, well, I teach one of those things, but super <laughs> learning, I don't. So I said, here's a website to my friend, Jim. He teaches super learning. He's a brainiac. He loves that stuff. And they said, ah, but I want to learn from you. And I said, okay, great. What do you want to learn? And they're like, well, ultimately, I'm a great singer and dancer in the Indian tapestries and what I do in India, but I want to become a global singer that sings all kinds of music that inspires the world like Michael Jackson. Cool. Like, okay, that's cool. And I said, well, here's the key. We're gonna have to find where in the world can we access the people who want to hear the music that you sing? Mm. Because there's three parts to this. Number one, we gotta find the people that love to hear the music you sing, whatever that is. <laughs> Two, we got to make sure it's something you love to do. We got to put you in an environment where you can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. We got to find the environment where she can be singing, learning about singing, practicing singing, singing with other people, singing with herself, singing in small groups, singing in big groups. We got to get her around it 24 seven. There's research that shows the three most influential elements around us that cause us to learn new habits and do new things. Number one, the people closest to us. Number two, the mass majority of people around us. We have a psychological trigger that wants to keep part, stay in the village, be part of the community. Just because back in the day, if you got kicked out of the village, you were pretty much dead. Because if another village attacked you and you didn't have a village to back you up, you're donezo. And so there's a psychological element that wants to stay in alignment with the village or the community we belong in. So the closest people to us, the many people around us, and then third, the people who are most powerful in what it is we want to do. Mm. So we look around and we say, who are the most powerful artists in the world? And as we identify the most powerful artists, we go, ah, we must do what they do and we'll, they'll influence our habits. So for this young woman who wanted to sing like Michael Jackson around the world, we have to find an environment where the majority of the people are doing this already and she can do it with them every day. We got to find an environment where the closest people to her are going to be doing it and doing it every single day. And we got to find an environment where the most powerful people in that environment are doing it and she can do it around them every day. And when we do, she will naturally start to adapt the habits necessary to become proficient, excellent, and eventually absolutely outstanding at the craft she's looking to do. Once she reaches that level of outstanding, now, when you're the best in the world at what you do, regardless if that's juggling fire sticks, doing backflips, painting orange squares, or anything else, now you have the ability to really monetize it, which takes away that element of worrying about paying the bills and having lifestyle. Because mm. now that's covered. 
Yeah. You know, there's a gentleman my dad talks about, one of his good buddies, who was so excited he bought this painting for like $40 million. And he's like, oh, you got to come into the house. You got to see it. And he's like, okay, great. So he got in the car, he drove to his house, and he's expecting like the most exquisite painting you've ever imagined. And he comes into the guy's house and he goes, there it is. And it's an orange square on the wall. <laughs> Dad's thought, and maybe I got this thought from him. He was like, I'm pretty sure I could have done that for you for half the price, pal. <laughs> and, and he's like, you don't get it. You don't understand what the guy went through to create this and the backstory and everything else that went around it. And the guy who bought it's a billionaire and loves this piece of art and loves it so much that he finds joy in a $40 million orange square. And so the question is, when you're the best in the world of what you do, and there's a thread of a story that's in your craft and connected to you, all of a sudden, people are willing to invest in it because they want to have part of that story. They want to be part of your journey. But you got to be the best. We went out to the street in South Africa and found a young kid who created the same orange square. I don't think someone would pay $40 $40 million for it. Mm. And not that it's not of same quality. It's they haven't done the first couple steps, which is becoming the best in the world at it, finding a place where people deeply desire to want a piece of that or be a part of it. And then the third step is figuring out how to present it in a way that people are willing to make that trade. Mm. And that's all a process. It's a similar process from learning it to living it to giving it to the world. It's the same thing where you're learning about something, meeting the right people with the right values, the right community, but they're not living it and they're not living it because they're not believing it. Yeah. That's a big thing for creative visionaries, whether they're innovators or lifestyle or whatever they are, designers. A lot of the times they have these great ideas where they don't believe in themselves. And that is the crux is when you don't believe in yourself. So. What are things, in your opinion, or perhaps someone that you could, that you admire, that lives their purpose, not their profession so much, but their purpose and aligns it with their profession, where they are believing in themselves 100% and then, because you need to put in a lot of hours in order to learn something and live something, but you're not going to live something unless you believe in yourself. Yeah. So how do you help someone believe in themselves in the beginning? It comes from experience Mm. and it comes from doing it when you don't believe in yourself and doing it so many times (laughs) that you start to have experience. Mm -hmm. There's an old story that a guy who was curious met a guy with experience and the guy who was curious had a handful of money. And at the end, the guy with the experience left with the money and the guy with who was curious left with an experience. And (laughs) It's silly, but it's true. It's the same thing in any sport, in any profession, in anything that you're doing. It's the concept of, and even if we left money completely out of it, how do you believe in yourself when you've never done something? That's Mm. hard. It's very hard to believe in yourself. Do I believe that I could stack 10 chairs on top of each other and climb to the very top of the chairs and stand on the top like this? (laughs) Probably not. I probably hurt myself really bad the first time I tried that. Bet I could do it on one chair. That's reasonable. That's believable. And I bet if I practice long enough on one chair and then stack two chairs together, I bet I could do two. It just takes some time. And I'd probably fall a lot and get some bruises and people would laugh and it'd be silly. But eventually, if I kept practicing, I bet I could get to three. And if I got to three, I bet if I kept practicing, I'd get to four. And someday, if I really, truly practiced enough, I bet I could get to 10. Hmm. and the belief of I could get to 10, some people start with the belief, meaning they mentally, and there's science behind this, where you close your eyes and you visualize and you create the vision of yourself doing it again and again and again and again. Now, the cool part is your brain doesn't know the difference between it actually happening and you imagining it happening. The neat part is every time you imagine it, if you imagine it happening positively and it's exciting to you, you'll get a blast of dopamine and the dopamine causes you to want to take action and try. If you close your eyes and imagine yourself failing miserably and being laughed at for failing, you will get a shot of dopamine. And if you train your brain right, if you learn how to take failure 
and how to twist it in your brain so that it actually inspires you to action. This was one of the, some of the most successful people do. Failure inspires them to do it again, inspires them to do it again. The failure of missing or messing up or screwing up or not making it, do it again, do it again, do it again. I'm not going to let that happen. Do it again, do it again. The fear of failure kicks off the same dopamine that causes people to take action to try to improve. And so you can literally use the fear of failure to kick off the dopamine. You can use the positive probability of it happening, this, the excitement of it working to kick off the dopamine. Either way, as long as the dopamine is kicked off in your brain, you will be inspired to literally take action and go try again. And so the real key, if you're building up the repetition to get there, is the concept of learning how do you kick off the dopamine in your brain again and again and again and again and again, which inspires action, 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 action. And all that action stacked up over time, eventually, if you keep doing it, you're going to get good at it. If I came to you and I said, you've never painted or sang a song. If someone came to me and said, could you sing as good as Michael Jackson? I would laugh at you and go, not right now. (laughs) I am nowhere close to that. But if I dedicated the next 10 years to making it happen and I practiced every day and I went and got the best coaches out there in the world to guide me and I got a singing coach and I went and did voice lessons and I practiced every single day. I did my 10,000 reps a day or that might be too many. I did my 1,000 reps a day and I did it every single day for 10 years. At some point, the amount of confidence I would have in myself would be through the moon not because I'm someone special, just because I've done it so many times, it's obvious of how to do it. It's ridiculously easily understood of what it takes to achieve it. It's not easy. It takes practice. It takes effort. The concept of exactly what it takes to get the result becomes literally a no-brainer because you don't have to think about it. Yeah, because hard work is what scares a lot of people, not just visionaries, to take the steps because they see the mountain and they don't see the steps. They have the vision, they have big dreams, but they fear it. So they don't even take the step towards it in order to create the action to believe in themselves. I love that. That's right. I'll insert a little thought here. It just came in on Instagram. It says, that also means you have to have the financial means to employ those people that can get you the best results. I'd say not true. This Mm. is where our culture has messed with our heads Because nowadays, we say in order to be the best, you want the best teachers, the best coaches, the best people to to support you and provide for you. But we live in a culture where someone takes a course and three weeks later calls themselves an expert. Mm -hmm. And so if I took one singing course and three weeks later I called myself, I don't know what they call master singers. I don't know either. I don't know. No. We're going to make one up right now. So I'm totally on the fly. A singer say, I don't know. No, we're going to say Andrea Buscelli. We're going to call yes. him a master singer. So let's say it's an expert level singer, a master singer, a master craftsman of singing, let's say. So if I took one course online and three weeks from now, I put the title on my website, master craftsman of singing people would come to my website with a certain expectation. Yep. They'd be like, oh, this guy can sing like Andrea Bocelli. Mm-hmm. Now, if I got up and sang, I guarantee after one course, they would have a rude awakening, <laughs> not because I don't believe in myself, not because I'm not passionate about it, not because I'm not excited about it. Mm. I don't have the same practice as him. I don't have the same length. And are there some young people who just magically pop out and do something incredible? Absolutely. My cousin went to Juilliard for dance and you see the most amazing little ones running around there. You see these little tiny kids who can play the violin at expert level when they're like this big. It's amazing. But those kids are rare. That's why that group literally travels the world hunting for the prodigies that they can discover who've been able to do that. For all of us other humans, we would need the practice. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the day, you mentioned something when we started. There's something that you would learn a craft. You would learn a trade. Now, if you wanted to become a master tradesman or a master tradeswoman in a trade, you would find an apprenticeship. Yep. 
And in this apprenticeship, you would spend five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, sometimes a lifetime of practice, practicing the craft over and over and over again until someday you're able to, you've learned it, you've lived it, and completed the craft regularly, and you've given it, you've paid it forward. I remember there's a story of a martial artist, and the martial artist they showed up and they learned the craft and they practice, 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 practice. And they said, I'm ready for my next belt. And they took the test and they got it. Practice, 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 ready for my next belt. Took the test and they got it. Practice, 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 took the test and they got it. And they got all the way up to like the supreme black belt level where there's one more super guru black belt level, the super top one. There's one more. And they practice, 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 practice. They learned it. They lived it. They learned it. They lived it. They learned it. They lived it. And they said, I'm ready for the test. And the master went, ah, you're not ready. And okay. And they practiced, 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 practiced. He came back and the master, he said, I'm ready for the test. And the master said, ah, you're not ready. And this went on for months, months and months and months. They just kept coming back. I'm ready for the test. Ah, you're not ready. And this guy was just pissed. He's like, I've been doing this for years now. I've been practicing every day. I've been doing everything. Like I've mastered every element of this. For decades, of like 20 years went by. And he's like, I'm ready for the test. He's like, you're not ready. He's like, ugh. And there's certain things only that top level can teach. Everyone else is not allowed to teach them. Mm. And one day, he saw this young kid who's like a new white belt or yellow belt. He saw him trying to do something. And he went, ah, oh, he's just not doing it right. Here, let me go help him. And he walked over and he said, here, you need to stand like this not like this. And he goes, okay. And he said, you need to move like this, not like this. And he goes, okay. He's teaching the young one how to do it. And as he's teaching the young one how to do it, the master walks in and goes, what are you doing? You're not allowed to teach that yet. You are not the grand master level. You cannot do that. And this guy turned around. He says, you know what? I've been practicing this for over 20 something years of my life. I don't need your permission to be able to help others do this. And the master looked at him and went, ah, you're here. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And something special happened in that moment. With all the practice, at some point you realize you don't need anyone else's permission. Mm -hmm. But it comes with all the practice. Mm -hmm. We live at a weird moment in history where people put in zero practice and decide that they're the leader. Mm -hmm. They decide that they've mastered the craft in a three-hour course. And what they're missing is the living it part. They're missing that 20 years of practice Mm. as an apprentice, as someone who's learning. I got invited to Harvard to go speak at a leadership conference. And it was kind of an interesting situation because they set me down and on my right, they had this gentleman much older than me and they introduced him. They read his bio. They said, this is professor so-and-so. He teaches leadership at Harvard University. He's written multiple books on the topic of leadership on behalf of Harvard University. And we'd like to welcome him to the panel and everyone claps. And they say, professor so-and-so, what is your version of leadership? And he says something really prolific and amazing. Then they go, this next gentleman is Jarek Robbins. And I'm waiting for them to read my bio. (laughs) And they hand me the microphone and say, why don't you introduce yourself? (laughs) I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) That feels like a setup next to this guy who wrote the book on leadership for Harvard. And the only thing I could think of, honestly, I've done some cool stuff. I don't know how any of those cool things telling you about them now is going to be useful to you right now, this moment. All I can say is what I really believe leadership is about is going out and learning what it takes to achieve the results you really desire, living and applying everything you learn to the fullest extent possible, doing the work and consistently applying it to get the results over and over and over again and fine-tuning it and mastering your craft. And then three, when you find out what works, take time to pay it forward and share it with others to help them level up and also master the craft. And I said, that's my two cents on leadership. I hope it's helpful and I'm excited to be here. I took the microphone and I passed it back to him. 
<laughs> and now the gentleman sitting next to me, they introduced him with his bio. This is, I forget his title, but very high up in the Air Force. He's in charge of the entire cyber security for the entire United States Air Force. He has thousands of people that report to him. He's leader so-and-so. And they said, sir, what is your version of leadership? And they handed him the microphone. He did one of the most generous things I've ever received in a moment like that. He thought for a second and he says, the definition the young man sitting to my right just described is probably one of the best outlines of leadership I've ever heard. I concur with him. Wow. And passed the mic back. And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I'm like, they let me in the club. You know, <laughs> thank God they were friendly today and didn't throw me under a bus. I felt honestly, I don't know if I was supposed to be sitting on that board because these people are much more accomplished than me. They're deep masters of their craft. They're leaders of tens of thousands of soldiers. There are people who teach leadership at major universities like Harvard. And my ego would be like, oh yeah, I'm totally supposed to be there. But the honesty of, I'm still learning. Mm. I'm still practicing. And my thought process of being an internal lifelong student, I would be happy to say the same thing 50 years from now. Mm. If I'm invited to sit on the same board with the new leaders of leadership, I'd say the same thing. I'd say, I don't know if I'm meant to be there. Leadership to me is not a position. It's a constant evolution of learning, applying, and paying it forward. And the only time it's deemed leadership is when it's passed on in some way that it's actually useful. Mm. Getting someone to follow you isn't leadership. Sharing something that's useful that helps them be happier, be healthier, be stronger, be more fulfilled, accomplish more, achieve more, do whatever they're after, I give leadership credit to just because I was like, wow. They actually made a difference that helped make the difference overall in that process. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a funky thing we live in nowadays with young people. And I'm young still, but we like to call ourselves experts. We like to think we're masters of crafts. And we've, we've given very little time to actually mastering the craft. We have not invested our 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would call myself a humble apprentice and someone who's just striving to learn as much as I can and fully apply it and share what's working with others. Yeah. I mean, there is no time when we really break it down. It's an illusion as well that we, I don't know if it was Einstein that said it, that time exists so that everything doesn't happen at the same time. <laughs> yeah, irony. And I believe that leaders are born. The illusion with that is that when most people hear that, they feel, oh, it wasn't me but we're all born leaders. It's just how we master it and how we learn and how we stay the student and that it's not the leader from the front, the leader from the back. How, moving on, so I can watch the time, for visionaries, creative visionaries that are leaders as well and wanting to lead within their niche and they're like, okay, this is the place that I belong. These are my tribe. This is my community. This is where I'm putting things out. And the one thing I need to learn is to put in practice and put in the hard work. And it's got nothing to do with time because mm -hmm. time is the thing that holds us back. Most visionaries feel that they're running out of time because they're ahead of their time. What advice or what tips or growth tips could you give to them today to align the belief, the leadership, the learning, the living and the monetizing of their idea that they have today, that they can put maybe three or four steps, lessons, principles that they can enact today, where they can go, okay, this is what I'm putting for the next three, four weeks. I need to put in the hard work to create that habit so I can start, it can start becoming a normal thing for me. Sure. So something really important that I've learned in this space is I enjoy putting in the time. Mm to get to a place. I've learned to enjoy that. Like I've sat on airplanes with people who are annoyed that they have to spend so much time between two places. I've sat on trains with people who are annoyed that it takes so long to go from point A to point B. I've also sat next to people on planes who are, are just out of their mind thrilled to sit in a plane and fly through the air and be able to look out the window and observe the magnificence of the planet below them as they coast over it so smoothly in the sky. I've sat next to people on trains who are glued to the window every moment of that journey, just soaking up the magnificence of Mother Nature coasting by on the train. Mm. 
And I see and meet these people every day in life. I meet people who are pissed that they're not there yet and frustrated that it takes so damn long and irritated that they haven't had everything they've always dreamed of yet. And I meet people who are glued to the moments of life, experiencing the magic moments and miracles that are unfolding in every breath of their body. And so what I would say to people who are in this position, who are wanting to get started, who are wanting to evolve, who are wanting to grow in this space, really, really fall in love with every breath. Mm. You said in the introduction, I was told at one point when I was 20 years old, I had five days left to live. That caused me to slow down and learn how to fall in love with every breath. It made me feel like every morning when I wake up and I'm still breathing, I go, damn, it's a miracle. I'm still alive. I get another opportunity to go try something today, to hone my craft, to do something I love, to learn something neat, to help someone, to travel, go on an adventure. And for many years of my life, going on an adventure meant leaving home. Mm -hmm. Now going on an adventure is staring into my wife's eyes, learning how to fall more in love with her every moment. As time goes by, we get used to and we start to take for granted the people around us. But to practice falling deeper in love with them, even though you've seen them a thousand times, you've known them for many, many years, your brain goes, yeah, I know everything about them. Find something new today you've never noticed about them. Find something you love about them that you've never thought about before. Pour love into their deepest uncertainty about themselves. Hold space for them and listen to them and just feel everything they feel. Instead of rushing to get to the destination of the journey, be the person who glues yourself to the window and really experiences every miracle moment that unfolds in front of you. I love to get up early and try to watch the sunrise. I think it's a miracle that it happens every day. I love to stay outside and my wife and I sprint to the balcony to go see if we can watch the sunset every day. It is a miracle as it unfolds. One thing that we love to do when we look at places we want to live is we look for places where people stop and watch the sunset because they're people who value things like we do. They value the magnificence of life unfolding before their eyes. So often, the reason time screws with us is we're so busy trying to get places and do things and accomplish stuff, we miss all the magic. And like you said, leaders are born. Some people know how to stand in present moment and really experience the magic of life every moment of it. But for many people, it's a practice that many of us don't take a whole lot of time to invest in every day. Yeah. Because it's difficult. It's difficult. And it's even harder in the moments where you don't have the money for the bills. And you're like, well, shit, I really want to watch the sunset, but I don't have dinner. Uh, I don't have time to watch the sunset. It's like, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You'll figure it out. You might need a better strategic plan in business in that case. Because mm -hmm. whatever you're doing, I'll give you a clue, ain't working. <laughs> Yeah. There's a practicality to this. I got hit up twice this morning. One, two people, one in Chile who was asking for help to start a business and one in Ecuador, I think it was Ecuador, who was asking for help to pay a hospital bill. And not, both of them are great people. The young woman in Chile had a much different scenario. She wants to start a business and she's looking for someone to help invest with her so she can open a business, turn a profit, and grow it and take care of her family in Venezuela. Like, that's beautiful. That's really cool. I'd love to find some platform I can invest in with her to help her do so. I just need something that holds her accountable and makes her really do it, not just take the money and do something random with it. Mm. The lady with the hospital bills, I'd love to be able to help her. The challenge that, that goes there, again, I'd love a platform that shows me how to connect those things. It's like a GoFundMe where someone can upload a hospital bill and people can send the money straight to the hospital kind of thing. That'd be pretty cool. P.S. For all you developers out there, someone create that. Uh, <laughs> Business opportunity, people. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> but the thought behind it, there's a practicality that they need to be able to take care of their family. They need to be able to pay their hospital bills. And so if their art is loving and giving and caring, some of us are hit in moments where at the very beginning of our journey, and that's when life kicks us in the face. Mm. That's probably the most difficult time 
because we haven't got any lift yet. We haven't been doing it long enough to have something that's monetizable that we can trade for the things we need to be covered in life. But if you've been doing it long enough and you've really put in the practice, and this is where most people are at, they didn't put in the effort. They didn't put in the practice when they had the time. One of my favorite sayings that one of my clients always used to say to me, they would say, before I had kids, I thought I was so busy. <laughs> then I had my first kid and I realized I was not fucking busy. <laughs> then I had my second kid. And then when I had my first kid, I thought I was so busy. And I had my second kid and I realized I had so much fucking free time with my first kid. And then I had my third kid and I realized two kids were easy and three of them, what the hell was I thinking? And I started laughing. And oftentimes that's where time goes. Mm -hmm. We think we're so busy because we're not comparing it to what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so when I talked about getting around people who are doing the things you want to do, oftentimes if they're closest to you, you'll see them accomplishing more in such short periods of time that it'll cause your brain to start to open up the possibility of what's actually possible in 24 hours of time. Hmm. Most of us live in such a limited perspective because the only people around us are people who've done the things they've always done. And if the people around us are doing the things they've always done and they've never done the things we desire to do, it's going to be hard to get an example of what's actually possible. And when you find people who are truly loving their craft, 16, 18 hours a day is nothing. Hmm. Time flies by. And when they fall in love with it, when they're really, really in love with it, three things happen. Time disappears, they disappear, and nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. You sit down in the morning, you look up, and all of a sudden it's nighttime, and you go, wow, where'd the day go? <laughs> you're in a state of flow. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in that state of flow is you're lost in the moment. You're completely in sync with your talents, your skills, your abilities, your craft at that moment. Yeah. And that's the true moment of apprenticeship in my eyes, when you're deeply lost in the art of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so there's people, when you're a born leader, that means you just have to start early and you need someone around you. You need someone around you that's willing to show you how to get deeply lost in the process of that magic that you most desire to invest your life into. Yeah. That purpose that's worth doing to you. Easiest way to find this is to identify your highest values. And as you identify your highest values, say, ah, what opportunities, what passions, what things align with my highest values so that I can spend 12 hours a day immersed when I have a free day, so I can get lost, so I can enjoy it. Mm. Sometimes you discover random ones. We were getting a video edited at one time, and the guy we hired said, oh, shoot, I can't do it. I got busy. So I started doing it. I spent like five days editing a video and loved every moment of it. Like time literally just disappeared. It does. And I'm, it. <laughs> and I'm not very good at editing videos. I just loved it. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I tease people. I'm like, I wish I could film my own videos, edit my own videos, and star in my own videos. Because if I could, I'd have some really cool damn videos. <laughs> but I got to tell you, at my current level of apprenticeship at video editing, on a scale from Grandmaster really, really, really good, pretty darn good, and you freaking suck. I'm right between you freaking suck and you're pretty good. <laughs> now, I'm cool with that. There's a realization when you hang out with someone long enough, when they start to realize it's like, ah, first level is I suck at this, but if I keep going long enough, I'll become good. And if I'm good long enough, I'll become great. And if I'm great long enough, hopefully I can become that grandmaster, sensei, guru, whatever. And you got to stick with it long enough. I learned something, my wife and I went and studied something for relationships and we learned a very specific set of framework of how to communicate when we're upset with each other. And it starts off with, I feel, and you voice the emotion, I feel hurt because X happened or when X happened and what I really need is whatever you need. And I remember the first time I tried to do it, I stopped and I was like, oh, oh I feel hurt when you said that, and what I really need is you to help with X. And she said, you sound like a robot. <laughs> like, like, just talk to me. Why are you, what are you doing? And I looked at her and I said, this is going to be one of the most important things I ever say. 
I'd love your permission to suck at this horribly long enough to become good. And I'd love your permission to be horrible and just good at this long enough to become great. And if I can keep going long enough at great, eventually I'll become unbelievably talented at this. And 30 years of research on 3,000 couples shows this will help us have a better relationship than without it. Because cool. it's really important to me if you allow me and if you're cool with me just being horrible at this for a while. But I promise I will never stop trying until I become really, truly a master of it. And she stopped for a moment. And she goes, you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. She goes, it was a good attempt. And I said, that's okay. I did it sound like a robot. But that's because I suck at this right now. Please allow me to continue to be horrible at this long enough to become great at this. Because mm. it would mean the world to me to be great at this for you and us. And that's the community aspect we talked about earlier, the people closest to you. If you can have a conversation with them that says, hey, I'm going to start something new and I'm going to be horrible at it for probably a pretty decent amount of time. Are you guys cool with me just being absolutely garbage at this for a while? And if you support me as I'm horrible at this, my goal is to become eventually great at this, but I'm really going to suck for a while. And I just need your support to kind of high five me and say, keep going until I do become great at it. And if your peer group is willing to high five you and kick you in the ass and tell you to keep going, even when you suck and want to give up, eventually you have a chance to become great at something. Mm -hmm. I hope the theme of this stood consistent from when we started Definitely. to here. Um, yep. For people who want to bring that belief in themselves to life, it's the consistent practice. It's saying, hey, in the beginning, I can psychologically believe in myself. I can mentally do the repetitions in my mind and do 10,000 reps a day every morning. I can physically move my body with micro movements and see myself doing it and build it up. But over time, it's going to take the consistent practice and effort to truly become a master at this. Mm -hmm. I love that. Jarek, that could just be like the end, but it's not because I have two more questions that I ask all the guests when we round off. One thing I wanted to say that you mentioned that someone said in Instagram was like, oh yeah, you can do all of that when you can hire someone, you have the money for it. I just wanted to add to something like that was that my experience and my belief is that often we have light and dark or hate and love. So we always have to experience the other half and see what the other half could be or is. So when we look at you and we go, or when you're saying, you're going, oh yeah, you hire a mentor. It doesn't have to be money. It's also volunteering. There's a lot of people that you can meet just by speaking to someone on the bus where you can learn someone or a homeless person. That's also someone that inspires you and motivates you. It doesn't involve money. So it's getting rid of that mindset, but it's yeah. recognizing and seeing oh, hang on a moment, that is something that I want. So if that's what I want and where I am now, the gap is something I have to work on and practice so that I can put action in that I can actually achieve that and move forward towards that. Yeah, I the just other piece to add that, that comes with that that's really important is the apprenticeship. Mm. That's why they were created back in the day. Yeah. You wanted to learn how to master a craft that someone else has mastered and you say, hey, I'm willing to come be an apprentice. Mm. The minimum apprentice payment was enough to survive and live, a place to stay, food. But the work each day of the apprentice was to constantly support whoever they were learning from and to learn, to hone their craft, to make them the closest person to you and to constantly be around them and when they're practicing and when they're doing it so that you too can master the craft. That apprenticeship or volunteerism within the organization, that allows them, like if you were in a kung fu organization and you volunteered to help teach the young ones that means you're practicing constantly every day if you wanted to become a master weightlifter and you practiced showing up early and cleaning the gym yogis do this a lot where you want to become a master yogi so you volunteer your efforts to check people in at the front desk and clean the studio and in return you get to come take classes and we can take this all the way back to the true origin where there was Master Yoda and Luke. I mean, they, he was an apprentice. He went to the swamp and he learned how to hone the craft of the Jedi. Mm. That's just for whoever really needed that reference. I'm sure you're <laughs> out there. You're welcome. Now you've got the rock in my mind. You're welcome.
We've got right. Rihanna and Mama and oh, that's so cool. So two questions. Fill in the gaps on three of my highest values and what they mean to you. Sure. Passion for you is. So passion is not one of my highest values. Mine. But what they would mean to you. Sure. What does passion mean to me? Mm. Excitement, determination. Cool. Wisdom for you is. Wisdom is one of my highest values. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me too. Wisdom to me is the constant learning, mm. is that constantly being a student. And to be wise means to be humble, means to be a lifelong learner. It means to constantly be learning and truly diving in and digging in to figure out what's really there, what's really true, what's really real. Mm, love that. We're pretty much the same lines. Creativity for you is? Creativity for me is a lot of fun. There are <laughs> so many ways to accomplish anything you want to desire in life. You just have to tap into the creativity to be able to see all of them. Mm. And how do you want to challenge or change the world doing what you do? How do I want to challenge or change the world? So I don't think the world necessarily needs to be changed. I think certain parts of the world need to be louder. Mm. And I think that's really important because people want to change everything. And whenever you change one piece of something, you change everything. And I think there's a lot of goodness and a lot of greatness in the world today. I think what needs to happen is we need a magnification of some of the most beautiful elements of life. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we see those things, usually when life kicks us in the face hard enough to make us sit down, take a breath and look around. And so if I was going to change something, it would be to cause people to slow down and to that. notice what's going on around them and to become very present it would cause people to fall in love with the journey and fall in love with the process of honing and mastering their crafts. And it would be to help people be happy, healthy, strong, and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that's available regardless if you're living in a village in Uganda where I used to live or you're master something tower of Hong Kong. Like all these things are possible regardless of where you are but it's a choice you have to make every day and then a process of habits you have to commit to. Yeah. I love that. It's an awakening that is rising up and has been rising up for a long, long time, slowing down. We love technology. It's all good, but learning how to slow down and not let it speed us up the way it burns us out. And I 100% agree with that or in agreement with that, that we don't need to change things. We're creative enough in that we don't need to fix all the problems, but that we can create new solutions that doesn't have to fix any problems. We're clever enough that we can find ways in which to enrich our lives by slowing down and by breathing. We've forgotten how to breathe. Thank you so much, Jarek. That was so cool. Yay, finally. Had a good conversation with you. I hope the Instagrammers enjoyed that as well. It was they awesome. Did. They were very excited. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and to all the listeners, you can find out more about Jarek pretty much everywhere. On Instagram, and this is something that you mentioned somewhere, Jarek, I can't remember if I saw it on one of your lives. So Jarek, when he posts on Instagram, it's not to have a pretty news feed. It's really to put messages out there because someone needs to hear something right now that's going to help them learn, live, and grow where they are at the moment and to live a happy and fulfilled life. So if you want not just motivation and inspiration, but actually delve into hearing a message that you really need right now, then head on over to Instagram, Jarek Robbins, and his team really put some really good stuff on there as well. Also, jarekrobbins.com. You pretty much find Jarek everywhere. And I've just asked him at the beginning, where the hell do I actually find out where you are when you're in Europe? So I can come and actually meet you, greet you, and see you speaking live. So get onto his newsletter so you can find out when that is happening. And remember to be the change that you want to see in the world and to live fast and furious. Remember to breathe and keep that vision on fire. 
and to keep the creativity alive. Love you lots and thank you very, very much for being with us here today. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Please, 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 please share the podcast and make sure you subscribe because a bunch of you aren't subscribed. And more importantly, I know that you've listened to this podcast and haven't told your friends, family, and besties and clients that this is the best podcast in the world. I'm watching. (laughs) Have a great day.